Welcome to the Data, AI, and Everything podcast, where we delve deep into the evolving world of data science and artificial intelligence. In each episode, we engage with leading experts and visionaries who are at the forefront of transforming the landscape of data and AI. Join us as we unravel the complexities and envision the future through the experiences and insights of our distinguished guest. Welcome to Casually Unboxed or Unscripted Open Conversation about Data, AI, and everything. I'm David Hardoon, the CEO of Avoidus Data Innovation, and I am delighted to be joined today by Celine Le Cotonek, the Chief Data Innovation Officer of the Bank of Singapore and Top 100 Global Data Visionary, I, officially. Well, so <laughs> welcome, Celine. It is an absolute pleasure to have you on the scene. Thanks, David, for welcoming he, me to your show. I'm delighted to be here. Now, I'm just going to, you know, come swinging straight off the back because, you know, we've spoken in the past and of course, you know, I've snooped on the, the index of one's experience being LinkedIn. You've gone from a wide range of capacities in terms of like a group EPSF, I'm pronouncing it correctly, which is mobility, cars, to private banking. <laughs> so I, I have to start, please. What and, I, and, and, and I did in between diplomacy, mining, and bakery, NGO in bakery for Chinese orphans. So, yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> diplomacy, baking, mobility, cars, and now private banking. What? What is that common outstanding? That's a funny thing, right? You know what? Because people told me, oh my God, you got, you've done so many industries, but it's actually always. The link is always data and maybe not on the energy side, right? But the link is upskilling, which is another of my big, of my big item and agenda as a chief data officer, upskilling the people. But if I should put it, so I'm a sinologist, right? Like disclosure, I haven't done a PhD in data science. I'm not a mathematician, not coming from an IT background. I came from a sinology. The what PhD usually stands for? Permanent head damage. So actually it's a good thing. <laughs> So yeah, I didn't went up to that stage, right? I think I, like, I, I'm pretty much a self-made woman, if you are, right? Like, so I moved from, so I'm originally from France and then I moved to China, Taiwan to be more precise at the time. So it's not really China, but it, they speak Chinese as a sinologist to do my study and, and learn traditional Chinese. And uh, this is where I started to work for a mining organization which is a very small SME Taiwanese company. They were producing stone crusher, right? Okay. And then I was, I was actually handling for them the, the European and, and North African market because I could speak French. And in Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, they mostly speak French, right? So okay. that's how I was brought into the business without any much degree of experience in going to deals, to go for dealing big 2 million contracts with Algerian government on road construction, pretty young. And that is quite interesting. That, that taught me as well that I need to know how to evolve in a in an environment when I don't understand everything and I don't in a VUCA environment, as we, as we say. And that was one of the learning, right? Then I moved to the French consulate. So I was in charge over there of all the business intelligence when it comes to, so that department at that time was called, uh, hold your seat, NTIC, hmm. new technology, information and communication, which pretty much stands for telco and internet, right? Or new language, everything that was digital, right? So my role was to look after the big internet giant that were being created at that time, because let's remember, this was back in 2007, the great firewall was, well, was still not implemented in China, which meant that Facebook was accessible, Google was accessible, everything was accessible in China by then. And, and then after starting to build relationship with the Chinese digital ecosystem. So I, I always joke when I say that I went to meet Ali, Alipay. There were like yeah. 107 employees and I went Wow, out. that is early on. I, exactly. That is really the beginning. And I was like, I'm not sure I understand. I miss this model. How really people like pay things through the internet. And I, <laughs> and, uh, and then now they became and financial. So it was really sure. early days of digital the digital revolution in China, we're not talking about the giant Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent by then yet. Yeah, WeChat was not existing. And so that was really an adventure, right? So working, I was really passionate about new technology, electric vehicle, and how China was moving forward in that area. That's how I moved to the mobility, so car manufacturer Peugeot Citroën, right? I went there originally 
to set up the procurement department, indirect procurement department, because there was a bit of issue in the organization with corruption. There has been an audit. And so I, I knew the CEO from my uh, past position at the consulate. And he told me, Celine, you speak Chinese. You got a good ethic. Come and work for us. We need someone that speaks Chinese, is able to read contract and, and, and able to help us and help me out of this mess. So that's how I get into the car manufacturer Petrosi trend. Just a quick sidetrack. When I was mm. at, uh, at the embassy, I set up this NGO, which is called Chenga Young Bakers, which is training Chinese orphans in, in French bakery. And uh, we always have this mantra, uh, motto, right? Give an orphan a bread, you feed him for one day. Teach him how to bake, you feed him for life. 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 And I think this is something, I know it, it's, it sounds quite unrelated, but it is really whatever I apply today in my CDO role, right? Like for me, upskilling, data democratization, teaching everyone the skill of the 21st century, whether it's data wrangling, data storytelling, Python, bit of SQL here and there, visualization, is how we actually help the people, right? It's not by getting more data science. In fact, in fact, that's one of the things I wanted to double click. And by the way, just to also emphasize, I, I love it how essentially it's a, a series of causal events with serendipity because of the language, it, oh, just do it, picking up. But like you mentioned, there's an underlying common thread, which by whether it is mining, whether it's mobility, and I'm very key to asking some of the differences, especially with private banking, it's about ultimately data. It's ultimately about how an organization uses information in their operations on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. But you're alluding to, and, and that's why I wanted to ask on, it's about people at the end of the day. It's about their ability and their understanding in terms of using that data. So, so what, I mean, given this vast degree of different industries, what, what have you found? Because, and, and it, if I swing forward to today with Gen AI and can't avoid it in panels or discussions, not, not to be avoiding it, but there is this continuous concern or this continuous, continuous debate about, oh, that's it. This is the end of the world. We don't need people anymore. It's always been a situation about actually us and our bar skill sets. So having been through these different capacities, these different roles, these different industries, what is that ultimately common thread above data in terms of talent, in terms of people, in terms of driving that degree of adoption? Yeah, I, I think it always starts from the top, right? And yeah. and to be honest, when I was come many in my, the car manufacturer, I started in human, then I've mo I moved to connected car, right? And then self-driving okay. car, that was coming up, right? And the usual reaction of a lot of traditional organization is fear. Oh my God, yeah. I'm afraid my business will be disrupted. And I call this corporate Darwinism, right? <laughs> That's true. It's either you change, either you're going to be gone soon, right? Because technology changes so fast, moves so fast. Then for a tra uh, traditional car manufacturer, right? Do you move into self-driving car? Do you start actually building all those capability? And to be honest, designing a self-driving car is very different from designing a traditional car. And, and so yeah, so people are afraid. And then at point in time, boards might say, okay. But Celine, why yeah. are they afraid? And, and it's actually, this is a very well, important point. It's disruption, right? It's disruption of what their, their current business is, is doing. They don't know if they'll be able to adapt, right? Totally different technology that is replacing what they have been doing. So, and so they're the afraid fear. people displacement. They will tell you okay. that self-driving car will create like 12% of unemployment in China, for example, because of all the ramification. At the end of the day, you got the, the car manufacturer, but you've got all the tier provider, you've got the drivers, you've got the, the workshop. All of those people need to be reskilled. It's totally different skill set to have a mechanical engineer and to have actually an, an electrician engineer to repair a car, right? So it's so people are afraid, right? People are generally yeah. afraid of change. But Celine. Is it from your view, and again, from your experience, and by the way, I take the fear seriously. I'm at this, you know, I've been in many conversations yes. where prior to that, I would take the view of oh, why, you know, you shouldn't be afraid, like, you know, taking it head on. And with time, I've realized that putting aside whether I believe the fear is rational or irrational, justified or unjustified, putting that completely aside, I take the fact that there is fear seriously. Oh. So it needs to be addressed. And the, yeah. the, what I wanted to ask you is, and again, it's really a, a perspective. Is it a fear that's born due to, this is what I do day to day. There's a change coming and let's just be blunt. I don't want to do it. So what I'm afraid is the fact that I'm afraid of that. It will force me to do something different. It will force me to do something new. 
that I have to pick up new skills. And that's the, the root cause of the fear. Or is the fear, I mean, if I force it into two buckets, the fear of the unknown. I'm actually not afraid about change. I'm not afraid about learning. I'm not afraid about adapting. But what I'm afraid is the not knowing of what may particularly come or what are those underlying skill sets that I need in order to adapt. If you see what I mean, it's a very kind of, it's a hairline split, but I'm just curious about that. I, I see what you mean. I think that the strongest one would be more of the first one. It's actually, right? It's the change, oh. right? Is that I'm, you know, like you're, you're putting me out of my comfort zone, right? Like you're putting me into an environment with things that I haven't learned. I need to be reskilled. And especially when you talk at the higher part of the organization, right? Like usually the younger employee are not really the issue, right? They're all keen on learning, developing themselves and stuff. But when you have has someone who has done pretty much the same thing for the past 40 years to actually change, it's always, and, and that it's not coming from them, then there's a bit of resistance, right? And, and yeah, after a few of the unknown would, would apply, but I think that the real, the real weight here is usually more the first one, right? Is having to have actually to upskill yourself, understand new things. Accept that also you will be, you, you don't understand everything, right? Because yeah. the, the world is getting so much complex, right? That you need to actually trust more people. Your expertise and your years of experience in a certain position yeah. does not guarantee so, anymore that. So Celine, I, I have, I see I'm having this cheeky smile because something is coming. I have to ask a potentially sensitive question, but I'm very curious. Then. On the one hand, you're, there's, you're saying, again, from a viewpoint, it's the first rather than the latter, meaning it's really about, I'm just comfortable. <laughs> so my fear is you're going to just move me out of my comfortable area. And that comfort grows with the years in doing it. So if you would say you're a young person, you're, uh, you're, again, young in spirit, young in heart, whatever you want to consider young, you're willing to like, fine, let's try it out. And you have someone who's doing it for 20, 30, 40 years, perhaps obviously there's a natural level of, of resistance. Prior, you mentioned that the tone has to come from the top. Now, if you go all the way to the top of the organization, board members, usually these are esteemed individuals that have spent decades in their position. So how does that align up? Yeah, I think this is the main, you got the crux of the problem, right? That, that's my position because it's the same thing with the data scientists today. And I was joking with one of my head of data science because I recruit young people, fresh grad, right? Because to be honest, nowadays, you will not find people with 15 or 20 years of experience in Gen AI because Gen AI did not exist, right? <laughs> 15 or 20 years, right? So this is, there is a kind of paradigm, right? With digital technology, data, AI, where actually the most skilled are usually not the, the most esteemed of, of our colleagues. And, and this is the change of paradigm, right? It's experience is not everything, right? It's how keen are you to learn? And I think it's, it's very, it's a very different way of seeing things. And, and that's, that's where there's probably a gap in understanding the power of those technology, how to govern them, how to like organization need time, right? When we talk about Gen AI, for example, there have been, I just had I, I just feel like four survey the last week alone from four different regulator in the world starting to ask, okay, how do we re regulate that? How do we govern that? And I'm like, it's, it, first of all, it's already out, right? So that's the thing with new technology, right? You can regulate and you can uh, try to govern and to police, but at the same time, you need to let the technology flourish so you can see what the potential and what are the potential risks, right? The same is for blockchain, cryptocurrency. <laughs> it's it, it's slow, but it's getting there. And, and I think that's, there was always a benefit, right? In the development of this new technology, those technology do exist for something, right? To solve the problem, right? A human problem or a society problem or, and, and eventually, yeah, we'll, we'll need to just accept it. Right. And it's, I don't know, I was yesterday, I was listening to a podcast of uh, Ledger Stacks, right? Uh, who is, um, uh, Ledger who is launching their new, their new custody key and, and the founder was saying it takes about 15 years for the adoption of a new technology. Right. And, mm -hmm. and we're like, everybody thinks that a smartphone is something so natural today. Right. But you know, back in 2000 or even before, right? never could imagine, no one could imagine that. Everything well, there is video well. records of the Blackberry yeah. in 2000, 2000, 2002. <laughs> a good experience. Yeah, a good example of corporate Darwinism, right? If you don't change, you just die, right? And I think the, yeah, the Blackberry example is a good one, right? And that's the one that board member can understand, right? Like deception, either I embrace it, either it's going to kill me, right? At point in time. So, so this kind of brings up a, actually, I didn't even think about this, but this brings up a very 
interesting dimension. If you truly think about, and, and let's broaden the world from data to just innovation. And, and I know it's, uh, it's in your title, so data and innovation, but if we broaden it from that perspective, and we think about what success looks like, or what perhaps, sorry, let me correct that. What is the ingredient to success before maybe double clicking on what success looks like? On what we just discussed, it almost feels like there is a continuous friction. And I think it's a normal one that's working against us changing because there needs to be an ability to go to that discomfort point. But of course, there's this, I don't know whether it's a thin buffer or for some people a lot larger where it become, before it becomes from discomfort to just pure panic. So given this paradox of actually you need, sorry, expertise is not necessarily measured by age. It's measured by a, a capability and an ability of adaptness in certain areas. In some areas, it is, I think, more compliance governance, which if you think all the way to boards, is traditionally situated around. If you think about the nature of an organization, you have operations and operations like just let me run ABCD and I'm trying to do this at the best of my capacity. When you come and say, no, we can do EHAT. How do we, I don't know if the word is harmonize or, or kind of balance these contradictions in allowing the drive towards innovation in making that ability to move forward. And I think pragmatically, if I'm fair to all sides, sometimes go, I see the innovation, I acknowledge it, but not relevant for us. On the other hand, say, oh, actually, no, this can be relevant. How do we successfully integrate? I think it's, uh, so a lot of awareness needs to be done, right? Uh, uh, the, again, in any successful transformation for an organization, I would always say that 80% is the people. It's, it's the mindset, it's the operating model, it's how do you reward those that are risk-taking, it's those that are the, the beta tester or the, those that are leading the change. It's about the training, it's about upscaling. So it's 80% is the people. And when I look at, for me, innovation, innovation needs to say, if you want people to adapt to innovation, you need to solve one of their pain points, immediate pain points, yeah. right? It might not be a fancy thing, right? But if you're actually saving one of their pain points on the day-to-day, -day, I'm, I'm just thinking about it because we're, we're developing something with innovation, with operation right now. And operation people are very busy people. They don't have time to attend Open Innovation Challenge and, and come to all those things and do extra training. They're on the dot, they're on the clock. They got a huge uh, backlog that they need to, to clear every day by a certain timing. And the question is going sitting next to them and then, okay, how can I be of help? H how can I actually, and then shadowing them and then telling them whatever you're doing right now, like it takes you about 30 minutes, right? To do that task, right? And I know where you can do it in two minutes, right? And if you have this repetitive task to do on a daily basis, then probably it could be good that you spend a bit of time to actually look at it with me. And, and that's it. It's about solving people pen point, right? So I think the, the, the biggest feeling that can current, I would say, uh, I would say the after fear, pain, right? Pain is stronger than fear, right? And I would say that. So if you yeah. manage to solve some of the pain of the people that they have on a daily basis, then they will be able to, they will be able to overcome that fear. I think and I think there, I think there, it's also very important to, and again, I don't take it for granted is to truly understand what the pain is. Because sometimes the pain, as it's perceived on the surface, isn't actually the pain. And if I go back, if years back, I, I remember interesting sessions and meetings that kind of between business and data scientists, where the data scientists or the data people will go away solving what they thought was the pain and coming on this is awesome thing and then present to the business and it will just fall flat on its face. Because while it's solving a pain, it wasn't solving the pain, <laughs> if that makes kind of sense. So it, I think it, it's absolutely critical and you're absolutely right. It's about people. It's about people. It's about mindset. It's about getting a momentum that there is a comfort in discomfort. I'm, I'm trying to harmonize in my head that it's, look, it's okay. You're in your comfort zone here. I'm going to give you a bit of something new and different and showing you how it's actually moving you towards that underlying direction. And so if I zoom forwards to now, private banking, and again, that extreme, I, I, I think extreme difference, please correct me if I'm wrong, because in my head, mobility, maybe not, I know. We're scamming a, a, a bit, yeah, the, the data type are different, we're doing different things, different use yeah, cases. Yeah, different pain points. Yeah. So how is it to drive innovation 
how to drive the data. I, I don't like using the word culture, but a, a data embrace. I don't know. It is. It is. It's a data culture that I'm trying to promote, right? And the data literacy. I was just over three years, we trained thir- uh, 300 people in SQL, right? So originally when I arrived in the bank, I was like, okay, we're going to have a hub and spoke level. And mm-hmm. people were like, what does that mean? I'm like, I run the hub. I have the center of expertise and you're going to you're going to upskill yourself and we're going to help you do that, right? And I'm like, I, I come to you, I, I, I want this dashboard. You, you, and I want you this do it for me. Yeah, you do it for me, right? I'm like, no, dude, I'm not IT and that's not how it works. Because if we start doing that, then very soon I'll have, I'll have a huge backlog. I'm going to be a bottleneck to the access to the data. And that's not what I want, right? Everybody right. needs data. And I'm not also a data extraction factory, right? <laughs> I'm going to teach you how to do it yourself. There's absolutely no value. In, in having my people extracting data to send them over email, right? This is a waste. Of, like there are too many steps in that process. We're going to give you an SQL script. You're going to implement, you're going to learn how to run an SQL script and get the data by yourself, right? So you don't need to wait. You can get it in real time. And at the beginning, people are like, she's crazy, right? We are not developer. I'm like, I don't ask you to develop. I just ask you to go into a tool and extract self-service, right? You need to learn how to do this by yourself. And this will be useful now, but this will be useful Anywhere else where you go in the rest of your career, this is a skill set that you need to understand. You need to understand mm-hmm. what a SQL query is. You need to understand that Python is not only a snake, right? So it's all about actually teaching the people. So we recently started to use Streamlit library, right, in Python because we're developing those data application and stuff. And, and it, it made me realize, wow, like the management is talking about Streamlit. I'm not sure they really understand what that means. They're like, Streamlit, <laughs> Streamlit is the solution, right? So I'm like, wow, like this is really data democratization, when your CEO start to talk about Streamlit as the solution to some of his problem, right? And why don't we look at Streamlit for that? And another example, I was seeing, I was in copy of two emails, two analysts, right? One from finance and one from, and they were exchanging in the core of their email, SQL query, right? Whether in the past they would have extracted from somewhere and then send the, yeah. the data to the other and trying to understand why are the numbers different between finance and risk. And now they communicate through SQL query. And I forward this to my boss. I'm like, you know what? This is data democratization. This is real data democratization, data literacy, right? People stop just extracting Excel sheet from, I don't know exactly where, and try to dispute if it's 1.2 and 1.6. They just share their code and I... you get, oh, right, you don't account for the loan, the loan bar loan or whatever in your calculation. And this is why our numbers are different, right? I, and, I um, love you. I love that story. In fact, I'm, I, I hope you don't mind. I'm going to steal it in there. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to steal this conversation because if you think about it, again, if you think about it logically, let, let's take the world of programming, let's take the world of the data out of it. When, let's say we do accounting or we do math, if I just give you a number and you say, hey, Celine, it's 1.5 and you're like, no, it's 1.7 and we have a sudden debate of, no, here's the formula. Here's the formula that I've used to calculate. And you look at me and it's like, and, oh, David, you, you're not including a parameter that you should, or you say, I, we shouldn't. And then suddenly we're having a conversation, which is of substance. Yeah. What is the formula? Why exactly. it should be this formula? No, it's a number. And I, I go, look, cause I, I didn't spend my time in the regulator. That was exactly the, if I abuse quote unquote, this term, the holy grail. It's not about the data. It's about no. having the underlying formulation and harmonizing it's about that. The aggregation methodology. It's about, and so that's why when, you know, one of the things that I did in arriving in the, and when I joined the bank, right, it's mm-hmm. like I had seven reporting, archaic reporting system, spitting out different data. I don't know, like why? <laughs> or probably because the, the logic that has been inputted in the database is different, but no one knows the logic anymore. I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm going to really? not try to spend time to understand. We're going to scrap everything. And then we're going to rebuild everything from scratch. And oh, with a that's... Proper data yeah. yeah, but that was quicker. That was quicker than trying to understand what was in those old systems called in, in Starproc from 2008, when before Bank of Singapore was not even called Bank of Singapore and, and, and belonging to another bank. I was like, we won't spend time doing archaeology. Sure. And, and this is where we realized that some of the metrics that actually Ooh. the bank was using were actually uh, based on the wrong understanding, right? Like the risk guy thought that excess was calculated that way. And then we told him, hey, dude, the truth is in the code. This is not what is being spit out by that system. So we rebuilt everything with the people that were there thinking about you know, each and every of the metric. And yeah. then every time I'm like, give me a name, give me an in- plain English definition, give me a mathematical calculation and give me the piece of Python code that is doing the transformation. And this is 
how we communicate. That's the, that's how we're holding it. It's not the number by itself. It's it's being able to get everyone agreeable on the metric. I, I, I love yeah. this and I, I, I couldn't help myself but check in the background is I'm, if it doesn't exist yet, I almost foresee it happening. You'll see data archaeologists. Because <laughs> you, you're absolutely right. And in a way, we're, it, it's history repeating. Cobalt code sitting mm. in banks on what no archaic systems. And it, it's actually interesting because I've, I've always had this view of, I call it uh, stock and flow. And, and the principle behind the, the, the framework of stock and flow is when you go about whether it's building a new system, whether it's putting new processes, is you always actually have to split it into this concept of stock and flow. Because if you try an architect for everything in one go, so stock meaning what you already have in place, good or bad, what you already have in place, flow is everything that's going to come now to the world and future effectively. And the principle that kind of says, well, if I try and architect a solution that is ultimately a future ready, blah, 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 and all this stuff, but I'm force fitting it to my stock, I'm force fitting it to the reality of today, you will end up with a Frankenstein. So yeah. I'm of the philosophy and view, which in some cases is a bit controversial of, I'm willing to sacrifice my stock. I'm willing to put it in a place and say, look, no, the system for it and let it over time be it uh, archived, you know, uh, sunset it, move the way, redevelop, whatnot, because I, I can't be shackled by the progress of my ability to move forwards and really re emphasize that to a certain degree. Oh dear, focus for a second. It's extremely important. But you, you said something earlier, which I want to zoom back to it while I'm fixing my camera is there we go, is rewards. Now, if at the end of the day, we agree that it's about people. We agree that it's about talent. And by the way, if, if, if you may, I, I'm going to take your phrase of self-made woman. I'm actually going to call it the self-made data for women to certain extent to self-made organization. It's, it's actually take, I think if I'm peering in between the lines, it's taking the same principles, the same mindset, the same approach of how do you embrace a new capability and, and, and skill and how do you adapt to it to an organization? How do you reward people? How do you now embed a, is it the exact same structure? Do you need to change the structure? Do you need to put a new reward mechanism? Like, how do you now incentivize people to go down that path? Again, you don't need to incentivize much when it's solving one of the pain points. As long as they understand and you're able to teach them how to do it, it's, uh, and the more you train the people, the more it's. There's also a bit of ego at the point in time. When I look at the relationship manager, right? Like now we have this SQL training for relationship manager, because similarly, oh, oh. every time relationship manager were meeting a client, then client was asking a question about his portfolio or whatever, the stuff that went with sales and stuff. And usually relationship manager prepare the meeting in advance, right? They get ready for this question, but sometimes they don't have all the answer. And then when this is the case, they need to go to their assistants, send an email, tell the client, I'm going to get back to you, blah, blah, blah. Or sometimes it's, it's a very simple thing that could, that could be actually answered into an SQL query. So some of the younger relationship manager were like, oh, we want to learn SQL. We want to get access to the data platform and to be able to slice and dice the information of our client on the spots. So I'm like, okay. So we taught some of them and then the colleagues seeing them actually getting real-time access to the data and being able to answer a question on the spot rather than going to ask the bidding manager, the assistant or whatever to find the information for them. <clears throat> then the other one was, oh my God, he has this capability that I don't have and that might, that, that might help him to drive more business. And, and so we get a tremendous answer from all of the other relationship managers. I want to be trained as well. I want to be trained as well. So there is this <laughs> healthy competition, let's okay. put it that okay. way. Where the one who get access to the info the quickest, they understand now that it has value, right? It took a lot to implement the hub and spoke model. It was not understood by everyone at the beginning. Yeah. They were like, why is the data team not doing everything for us? Because, you know, if I, you know, I'm, I just have so limited resources and again, I'm going to become another bottleneck. And, and so that's not my goal. And the more I upscale, that's what I told my team originally, because to be honest, we don't have the data science team doesn't always work on data science use cases because sometimes the pen point are just so simple, right? Before yeah. quenching a very, yeah. you know, like the people are just on Excel and when struggling with their email alert, there's no workbook for them to work with. You don't do AI on, on, on spreadsheet. Yeah, right? And also as a private bank, we don't have that much data, right? A lot of time we don't even have enough, you know, enough data to actually train a, a model by itself, depending on what type of use case we have, right? Yeah. 
where the people really need, right? It's automation, it's process reengineering. And this is where the innovation part come from, come in. It's, you don't need to do a, a crypto wallet to be innovative, right? You just look at the process that you've been doing for the past 15 years, sit down, do a design thinking workshop, look at how many steps you could remove and how could you do it differently and how could you not only solve your pain point, but mainly the pain point of those that are upstream your process or downstream your process yeah. and, and try to look at it holistically end to end. And, and this is where we're helping the business, right? We're putting them together and we're trying to solve one pain point, usually starting from the RM and then after looking at, okay, this is impacting compliance, this is impacting ops, this is impacting finance, those are the back office downstream. And if we start to work on that project, then all of those people come point will be sold, right? And, uh, and we'll be able to track and we'll be able to collect data. And when we start collecting data, then after we're going to be able to do some kind of predictive analysis or other, right? And, uh, and where Gen AI can help now that Gen AI also have this uh, capability to be more productive whenever it, it comes to content generation. So that's, I think that's the lens that needs to be taken. It's always to answer an immediate problem. And sometimes it's not the fancy thing that does, really? right? Basic. And then having the ability to actually, so today we're building, of course, some of those data applications for the business, but always along someone in their team. Because they need to be able to do the maintenance of this data application to enhance mm -hmm. it in the future. And, and, and they need to have the skill set again, right? And I can give you another very Please. good example. There was this, there was this young guy when I, maybe a year after I joined the bank, right? He was in ops, right? In operation. And his job was data remediation. So he was hired to remediate the data in the system, looking at document, making sure that the input was right in the client system. So it's mostly client data. And then he was, he's been here six, seven months, right? And then after his contract was finished and he came to me just before that and he said, you know what? I've been doing data remediation. I understand how much data quality is important. Now I understand why we're doing that. Uh, and I know that analytics is, is the future. So you're, yeah. you're proposing all those data literacy track, all those training. I want to be trained. I don't know anything about coding, uh, but I want to be trained and I'm willing to, to try and to upskill myself. So I'm like, okay, I don't need people who code. I need people who are willing, <laughs> right? So come, run our team. Yeah. So he came, he joined our team. I didn't even know the data science team and where he taught, he, he was taught Python, right? By, by the team, uh, starting with very basic data cleansing activity and that, that, that. One year later, he been recruited by Facebook. Wow. Right? And so that's why I said, if you really want to change, there is a myriad of opportunity that can present to yourself. You go from yeah. someone in ops doing data remediation to a developer in Facebook. And then this is what my team and the value that I'm actually pruning in the organization. Not that I want everyone to go and work for no, 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 of course, I'm right. sure. But this but, is that everything <laughs> is possible, right? If you're just willing, everybody can learn anything. And I came, and this is where my sinologist um, uh, mindset comes, you know, is helping in my job. I'm like, Python is just a language. SQL is just a language, right? It's just another language to learn. It's not difficult, right? If you're speaking English and Hokkien and, mm -hmm. you know, in Malay, then that's just another language. Of course, it takes practice. Of course, you need to understand, but like, like any other language that you have to but, learn. But you know, Celine, the difficulty there that I can almost envision some may have, whether they're cognizant of, of, it, of it or not, is yes, you need to have the will. In fact, I was thinking about it. It's very important to have the right composition of the team and will sometimes is far more important than, let's say, just raw skill. But it's also having a, not necessarily long-term vision, but not a, short term immediate reward. And I think if there's something that sometimes we fall into for various reasons, the shareholders, stakeholders, plenty of reasons is immediate returns. It's like, it needs to be right now. It needs to happen right now. And ultimately that could get us to, to, to the point when you, you're getting like immediate drops, immediate value. But if that's onset of creating the landscape of creating the environment, creating the it's not like you suddenly walk out and there's a garden and there's trees. It's you have to first take all the weeds out. You have to work the ground. You have to fertilize it. It's, it you need that time in order to get that environment. And the example that you gave, obviously, <laughs> you don't want everyone to, to go move to Facebook or something, but that's a perfect example of you get the rewards. You, you'll get better individually or organizationally. Because imagine you have that mindset of people that could be hired by the Googles, AWSs, Amazons, Apples, whomever you want in the world, in your organization. It's like good luck stopping transformation. It's that'll be impossible. It will happen whether you like it or not. 
So that is really critical. It's really important. And I almost kind of surmise what you were saying earlier is that this is, I, I'm going to call it pragmatic people-centric innovation. <laughs> it, it, it is. It, it, I, I know it's a whole bunch of words, but it, it's actually, it, it's very explicit. It's pragmatic people-centric innovation. Okay, to be very transparent and honest with you, David, there are immediate rewards. Like, ah, okay. if you run on my track, you get a $20 voucher for Starbucks, right? <laughs> <laughs> and you pay people to get us, because that's probably why there's a bigger upside. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you can pepper the two together. Immediate <laughs> rewards and some long-term ones. <laughs> So you got some data family merchandise, right? And so data family is, is the name of this community that I'm trying, like it's, there's no name, right? It's everyone who wants to learn. And we have about 600 people in our data family chat. This is the most active team site in the whole organization because of the content that we're posting and people asking questions, how do I do this, that? And, and so, yeah, and so we developed as well, funny story, right? During the whole NFT hype, we develop a system of NFT mechanism for rewards. We have developed those different tracks looking at the person now, right? You have the data consumer track, you have the dashboard builder track, you have the SQL user track, and then Python developer track, right? And so every time you have four different levels, right? Let's put it that way. And so we develop a series of NFT internally uh, that also you can put in your signature, right? So you have on your mobile. So today we're, you're not able to transfer those to your MetaMask and to make money of it, but soon, <laughs> eventually, in terms of reality of blockchain, but still, right, like people are able to show and through an NFT, which can be verified, that they have actually taken those courses and that they are at their level of their data literacy. Yeah. Just a fun story. We wanted to make something fun, right? Like not taking ourselves too seriously as well, right? That's part of the immediate reward that you can get along with the Starbucks voucher. And then uh, well, it's, I love it. It's absolutely fantastic. It's wonderful. So if you had to force to surmise maybe in one, two, three, recommendations to people listening in, whether they're at the onset of their journey, whether they're managers, whether they're heads of departments, whether they're equal CDO, in terms of creating this type of perpetomobile, because that's ultimately what it's kind of needs to be. It's a, an engine that is able to fuel itself. What would be those advice points for them to take under consideration? I think the advice that I always give my team is who doesn't, fail, who doesn't try, doesn't fail. Right. You know, if you change your perspective for once, right. And I'm not always looking for success, but, you know, actually looking for trying and experimenting and, you know, being okay with failure. Right. And when you do fail, then take the, the quick approach, right. Let's kill it. Right. Like don't need to drag this because we spent some time on it. Then we need to drag it. It's not working. It's not working. Let it go. But that's the thing, like, we don't need to be hundred percent certain of the things. And, and today we're in a world, finally. People want to have certainty and who could have predicted the pandemic of COVID? Like things, nothing are more uncertain than the world that we're living in because it's, it's being so complex and intricate with other government, technology taking up, disruption, new technology, you know, the growth of the human population. So many things are happening, right? That you don't control. You need to, to let go with not being in charge and, and being in control, uh, but develop that um, attitude and mindset that being open-minded and willing to try and okay with failure. It's, it's mm. always, innovation is always about being okay with failure. It's one to take to the bank. <laughs> no, it's unintended. <laughs> Celine, I just want to say this is absolutely fantastic and can continue talking about it. And if I summarize it very briefly, it's rewards, not fancy, solve a pain point, understand the pain point. It's about people, the composition of the team, having that will. And I, I, sorry, I'm, I, I know I, I, I said it, but I like it. It's like pragmatic people-centric innovation with immediate rewards, but also having a lot of vision. Celine, thank you again. And thank you for all the people listening in. Until next time on Casually Unboxed. Thanks, David. This was awesome. Oh, wow, this is fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for joining us this week on the Data, AI, and Everything podcast. Make sure you visit our website at aboetesdayatinnovation.com, where you can subscribe to the podcast and find our show notes. If you enjoyed listening, please share on your social channels as well.